Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be able to talk to you about the Eclipse. Uh, my name is Don Davies. I work for Hill Country Alliance. We're a nonprofit conservation organization located in Central Texas, and I predominantly work in night sky preservation. Uh, so I work with a lot of communities, volunteers, organizations in combating light pollution. However, I'm also an amateur astronomer and astronomy and space science educator. So uh, I've got a very passionate about eclipses. I saw my first one in 2017 in Casper, Wyoming, and was in San Antonio for this last October annular eclipse and um, have just become what they refer to as a, an eclipse enthusiast. Uh, most likely I will become an eclipse chaser myself after this one coming up in April. So let me go ahead and share my screen and... Hopefully I'll be successful with that. Let's see. And... All right, can you all see it? Okay, thank you for the thumbs up, I appreciate that. All right, so first off, I want you to just kind of take a moment and for those of you who maybe haven't experienced a solar eclipse or total solar eclipse before, you are going to experience a full sensory opportunity. Imagine it starts getting darker and darker, things quiet down, the temperature gets cooler, you stop hearing birds and crickets, you're going to start seeing shadows moving across the ground in front of you, um, and you are going to experience something uh, that is occurring on earth, but is very unearthly. Um, it is a very unique opportunity. It is not rare in the sense of it doesn't happen. Total solar eclipses happen every 18 months somewhere on this planet. But what is rare is for you to be able to live somewhere where you don't have to travel to see one. So pretty remarkable. We have them uh, in a very unique manner. So they occur because of how our earth circles the sun, um, but they don't occur every single time the earth circles the sun. They don't occur every single month because of the uh, arrangement that we have with our moon. So it is on this angle here. You can see my cursor just off by about uh, five degrees or so. And as such, it means that they only occur when the earth and the moon line up just precisely. Um, we have total solar eclipses when the earth is at its closest approach, perigee, when it's in new moon form. Um, and they're farther apart at apogee from what we experienced with the annular eclipse. It means the moon is a little bit further away from us, so it doesn't completely cover the sun. Um, but it is unique in the fact that the size of the moon to the size of the sun, the distance of the moon from us versus the distance of the sun from us is exactly a one to 400 time ratio. We are the only planet in our solar system that gets to experience this. Um, and we will for about another, I believe it's 6 million years or so. Um, um, as this, the moon slowly moves away from us, it will become harder and harder, uh, much outside of our lifetime uh, to experience these. Uh, but they are rare in a sense that you get the opportunity to observe one here in Central Texas and, and throughout various parts of Texas. Uh, so we have the total eclipse and the annular eclipse, as I mentioned, occurring depending on where the moon is at its distance from us and in its alignment uh, with the earth and the sun. So give you a little bit of history. So we estimate that for over 3000 years, civilization has been capable of, of predicting eclipses in a sense. Um, we have a couple of uh, very early depictions uh, through the Mayan long count calendar. They were able to calculate eclipses that had possibly occurred in the past or were going to occur in the future. Um, the Ugarit template, uh, which is from what is now known as the coast of uh, Syria, was believed to have documented eclipses that were going to occur within the area. Um, that is the most physical representation we have of eclipse documentation. Um, it is possible that uh, the eclipse of Thales in 585 BCE was also, again, a predicted eclipse, but we know for certain documentation uh, was most prevalent in 1715. Halley's eclipse, if you've heard of Halley's Comet, then you've heard of Edmund Halley who documented the eclipse. But what I have found the most fascinating as I kind of do a deep dive into what they refer to as umbrophile, so eclipse chasers, is just how many women in the early 1800s through the early 1900s were scientists, were eclipse chasers. Um, 
So Mansfield and Mitchell uh, were two of the early female eclipse chasers, um, and they actually uh, observed the eclipses uh, from as far away as the transatlantic eclipse. So they were actually looking at the spectroscopy of the sun, which is phenomenal um, because, you know, spectroscopy is it's a fairly new science in a grand scheme of things. And we're learning just more and more as we get into a lot of science with, for instance, the, the Hubble telescope and so forth. Um, Mabel Loomis Todd, it was a 17th century uh, writer uh, and editor and avid eclipse chaser. And she actually traveled to Japan in 1887 to observe the eclipse and has since wrote two books about solar observing and also science predictions of eclipses, uh, both past and present. Um, Another one who was an author who wrote a book called Chasing Eclipses, the total eclipses of 1905, 1914, and 1925 uh, was Rebecca Jocelyn, who was an American writer and actually a friend of uh, Mabel Todd's as well. Um, astrophysicist and astronomer, um, British astrophysicist and astronomer, Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin, she actually observed her first eclipse in Africa in 1919. So again, most of these situations are where astronomers and enthusiasts have had to travel long distances to observe these. Um, and even as far as 1910, uh, Annie Louise Virginia Dow Dowell, who went to Australia, she was actually the first Australian women, woman to uh, have her observations officially documented. Um, Campbell Chant, uh, oops, change go back. Uh, Campbell Chant, um, Everson, this was the first female expedition where these five females were accompanying their husbands and fathers, but actually they were all scientists in their own right um, who documented the eclipses of uh, 1922. 1972 is actually our first, uh, what we think is the first actual ship expedition uh, that took about 835 passengers to uh, observe the eclipse in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so pretty ast astronomically uh, surprising. We do have a lot of cruises. Cruises have become very popular for eclipse chasers all over the world. Um, my personal, uh, I'd say, uh, a guru, <laughs> mentor, uh, amazing eclipse chaser in her own right, uh, Kate Russo, uh, who is from Australia. She actually just observed her 14th eclipse uh, here in the Central Texas area. She's written a book about eclipse chasing. She also helps to actually educate uh, communities as well to prepare for eclipses. So a long history of eclipses and especially long history of women's roles in eclipses. Um, so for those of you who have observed an eclipse before and who are preparing to observe an eclipse, consider yourself an eclipse chaser, consider yourself a female eclipse chaser. You know, this is a very exciting time to be alive and involved. And one of the reasons why this is so crucial, I feel, is if you look at just the number of total solar eclipses we had that were viewable from the U.S. in the 20th century, you will see one thing missing from all of these is that none of them were viewable from Texas. And it isn't until the 21st century that you see Texas cropping up. The first one for this current century will be next April. Um, after that, you'll have to wait till 2045 to observe one. And it, you have to be in the very northernmost, I think, northeasternmost portion of the panhandle to observe it. 2052 and 2078, you have to be in the southernmost tip of Texas down in South Padre area. Um, we are not going to see another eclipse crossing Texas in this capacity until beyond the, the year 3000. So now is the time to observe it. Now is the time to take advantage unless you plan on, on traveling extensively to foreign countries, um, to, you know, to Egypt, to Australia, to view the upcoming eclipses um, in the years following. So this one is crossing the United States. It's also crossing Mexico and Canada. Um, unlike the annual eclipse where Hawaii was not on the path at all um, or in even partial eclipse, every single state in the US, every single province in Canada and all of Central America and even a little bit of, of South America will get to experience this in some capacity. It won't necessarily be total, but it will be some form of partial eclipse. So this is a very all encompassing event. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, the best place to be is closest to the center line. That's going to be your maximum amount of totality. So that's the amount of sun that is covered by the moon. Um, within those partiality zones, you can be there. Your totality time will diminish slightly the further you get away from the center line. Um, but if you are on either side, the outside of those partiality zones, 
you're going to get 99.9% or considerably less. Um, my favorite analogy coming out of a recent American Astronomical Society lecture about eclipse preparation was uh, that is the equivalent of putting your kids in a car, driving to Orlando, Florida, getting to the gate of Disney World, and then turning back around and going home. What's the point? If you're going to observe this eclipse, get on the path of totality. Um, one of the things I actually want to read, this this was a wonderful line um, from uh, Mabel Loomis Todd's first book on a total eclipse of the sun. And she wrote, I doubt if the effect of witnessing a total eclipse ever quite passes away. The impression is singularly vivid and quieting for days and can never be wholly lost. And I just, I love that because my first eclipse, like I said, was in 2017 and it forever changed me. It It is, it is not something that occurs regularly that we think, oh, it's, it's an eclipse. I've been there, done that. Um, it, it is a, a singularly unique event. And for, for everyone, it's something different. So it's, it might be something spiritual. It might be something religious, but one of the things that I love about this particular upcoming eclipse is how unifying it is to think that every single person in North America is going to get to experience this in some form or another and relatively all at the same time. I mean, it's, it's a, an event that, you know, has no uh, religious borders. It, it, it has no language barriers. There, there's no obstruction to observing this event regardless of who you are. I mean, the only thing that really limits you is where you are. Um, so part of this, as I mentioned before, kind of looking at that video in the very beginning is, is just how singularly um, sensory it is. So we go through these four points of contact. So the, the first contact is that partial beginning where the moon starts covering the sun, moving into second and third contact. That's your point of totality. So that's when you take the glasses off. Everything leading up to totality and after totality, have those glasses on. That is a huge safety component. There you go. I like it. I like it. Julie's putting your glasses on. Excellent. Uh, but if you if you have those glasses off and you're in the path of totality and you have them on during totality, you're not going to see squat. <laughs> so make sure that you have your timings down. Um, and, and it's not just the, the period of totality. So in, in the United States for this eclipse, the maximum period of totality is four minutes and 26 seconds. Leading up to that, we're talking about almost a little over an hour on each, each side of, of totality. So again, observe how light and shadow changes. It, it's drastic. I remember at the annular eclipse, even though we weren't seeing all of a, a, a full total eclipse, halfway through, you know, those of us kind of just stopped and, you know, took our glasses off and, and looked around because the color changes, the feeling changes, it gets quiet, animals stop moving. They think, oh, it's time to go eat, it's time to go bed down. It, the temperature drops from 15 to 20 degrees during a total eclipse. If only these things occurred more in the Texas summer, I think we'd be much more enticed to, uh, to experience them. Uh, shadow beads come across the ground right before totality. We're even not really sure how they happen, but we, we know that it's the shadow of the moon crossing the surface. Um, moments before totality, you get what's called Bailey's beads. And that's the sun that's actually piercing through the ridges of the surface of the moon. And it's, it's like these little dotted elements along the outside. And then right before totality, you get the Bailey area, you get the diamond ring. And that's that, that bright, stunning effect in this, this third little graphic here. Um, but all the while leading up to it, all, all the while leading after it, these amazing sensory experiences. And, and one that I think is just truly phenomenal is 360 degrees of sunset fully around you. It's just, it's just unreal. So here's where, where we're going to be experiencing it. A lot of major cities and a lot of small communities on the path of totality, uh, which is much different from 2017. In 2017, the largest community that experienced the eclipse was Nashville, Tennessee. They've got a population of about 300,000 people. Um, we're looking at San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth area, some of the largest cities in the country. Um, we estimate between about 30, 32 million people live in this nation on the path of totality. So one-tenth of our our nation population will not have to travel, but that does mean 90% will. So we do anticipate a lot of folks coming here into the Hill Country. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, these are sort of the major communities that are on that path and roughly what they can be expecting as far as the, the duration of totality. So again, as high as four minutes, 25 and 26 seconds. If you're on that very edge in places like San Antonio or Austin, you'll get 30 seconds. Still 
better than turning around and heading back home instead of going to Disney World. So part of this whole experience is just the various many ways to view it, to engage, to be a part of it, uh, to experience it. There are direct and indirect options. Uh, so as Julie was pointing earlier, there's solar glasses, using solar cards, um, very specifically, number 14 welder's glass. Um, all the kinds of viewers that are out there are great ways to observe the eclipse directly, as long as you make sure that your equipment is certified, ISO, and ideally CE, which is the European certification. But there are so many other indirect ways. So for those of you who have observed eclipses before or even observed the annular eclipse, I think looking at the light coming through the leaves and branches of trees is just glittering on the ground. Um, NASA and various organizations have put together these great punch cards that are available that show you how looking through even various shapes like triangles, squares, and circles still produces the same crescent shape on the ground because our sun and its vast distance away from us is a circle, ultimately a sphere. So it, it's uh, it's really incredible to look at these various options, pasta spoons, slotted spoons, my favorite by far hands down, a Ritz cracker, anything with any kind of little little opening through it. You can even take your hands and, and make little hash marks with them and they will still produce crescents on the ground. Um, there are just so many phenomenal ways to, to experience this. So Break out your colanders. I, I highly suggest buying one if you don't have one already. I'm I'm kind of excited to see how how much of a run there is on pasta calendars and salad calendars leading up to this eclipse because it's such a great way to go about observing it. And then of course there's just the solar cycles in general. So we uh, record and and process data and uh, track solar eclipses based on the SARO cycles. And, and what those are ultimately, without going into too much technical data, it's uh, pretty much a cycle of which the sun moves through its processes and eclipses occur based on it coming back around to its exact place within our solar system, exactly where the earth was and where the moon was. So we're in this cycle 25. We're also in what's working up towards what's called solar maximum. So the sun goes through a life cycle of activity every about 11 years. And actually we were in what's called solar minimum back in 2017. So not a lot of activity, a very bare, in some cases, bald looking sun. Um, but if you have the ability to look through a telescope or a pair of, of binoculars and see if they show up well <laughs> with solar filters on them uh, leading up to the eclipse, even now there's so much activity going on. There's so many sunspots, so many solar flares and prominences. It's a very highly active time for the sun. And it's a great opportunity to take advantage of this phenomena by observing the sun and getting a little bit from, more familiar with this, our star that pretty much is our our reason for existence, or at least one of our highly uh, needed reasons for existence. So as I mentioned, telescopes through various types of filters, white light will just give you a very soft yellow appearance. If you get into something highly more technical like a hydrogen alpha filter telescope, which narrows down and only gives you that spectrum of hydrogen alpha, the sun will appear very red. This is great for observing prominences and flares. The white light filters are great for observing sunspot details. Um, even using appropriate and certified adapters for your phones or for your cameras is another great way to document it and observe this eclipse. But if you want to get into a lot more technical things, the availability of accessible elements and devices for this eclipse is just a, a staggering. So the light sound device is this amazing device that was uh, collaborated upon and created by scientists and individuals at Harvard that sonifies the solar eclipse and the sun experience for the blind and low visually impaired. Um, getting a feel for eclipses uh, was actually first put out by NASA in 2017, and it's being put out again for 2023 annular eclipse this last few months and for the 2024, which is a very tactile and braille oriented uh, handbook for uh, learning about the eclipse. And then Eclipse Soundscapes is a way to both experience and sonify and store data. And it's an opportunity for you to submit that data to the team and also provide your sensory experience and observations of the eclipse. 
if you want to get involved in citizen science, there are a whole lot of opportunities as well. Uh, options from Sunseeker, where you are asked to just make your observations. SciStarter um, is a, a great opportunity. I think they've got 13 different citizen science programs you can participate that are solar related. Uh, citizen Kate is another great opportunity. These are all areas where you can get involved from something as simple as just downloading an app and recording and taking pictures of your observations to uh, obtaining devices and recording the data. Uh, Globe Observer, if you're familiar with the Globe program, uh, which is in a lot of our school systems, which is engaging students to research and record observations on cloud formation, temperature, precipitation. They're looking for that kind of information in tangent with the eclipse occurring. Um, ham Radio, Ham Sci is an opportunity uh, to work with ham radio specialists and and amateur ham radio operators uh, to do research and record data specific to the ionosphere of the sun. So a lot of great opportunities there for citizen science. If you're an educator or are just an enthusiast like me, um, there's things like the Eclipse Ambassador Program, which is a NASA Partner Ambassadorship Program with NASA and the Astronomy Society of the Pacific. So they are looking for both astronomers or Eclipse enthusiasts and undergraduate students to partner with them to get folks to be more present in the community and do more outreach to youth, to underserved areas, um, to really get this information in the hands of those that may not have it readily accessible to them. Uh, SEAL is another great program, the Solar Eclipse Activities for Libraries. Uh, they're looking for SEAL ambassadors. So again, enthusiasts, educators, uh, to connect with their libraries to help educate the public. Uh, the ASP Eclipse Stars is specifically for educators getting their hands on a lot more accessible educational materials. So there are and there are more programs than this. These are just kind of some of the more relevant ones, the ones that are, are easy. And again, with the citizen science ones, those range from, you know, kids being able to submit drawings um, or just record their data to, to folks that want to be a lot more technical. It's a huge range of opportunities and options. We have an Eclipse portal within Hill Country Alliance uh, that we've put together to mainly work within our Eclipse team. We have about 600 folks that are involved and have been involved for the past two and a half years on preparing the Central Texas and Hill Country area to get ready for the eclipses. So we convene quarterly roundtable meetings and we um, have convened bi-weekly lunch and learns, educating folks on everything from managing, uh, you know, emergency safety and from educators. We've actually, our most recent, uh, one of our most recent speakers was Katie Rainey, who's the interpretive manager for uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. And she has put together a wonderful collection of education materials and opportunities for folks to better engage the eclipses because we have 33 Texas state parks on the path of totality in April, which is phenomenal. We also um, are in the process of updating a lot of our resources. So everything from how to create a sun funnel, how to model the universe, uh, or sorry, how to model the eclipses in the universe, um, things like, uh, how to make a sundial and tell time with the sun to a great yardstick experiment, which models and helps you kind of capture the sunlight and try to get it uh, so where that the moon, uh, which is that tiny little ball you can see at the top, uh, casts a shadow on our earth, which is right down here at the bottom. And it's harder, it's harder than it looks. So uh, imagine how hard it is for the universe to do this every 18 months or so. Our team is across 23 counties, um, but of course, we've got a lot more folks that are engaged outside of the area, both in Texas and surrounding states. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the folks and communities we've been working with, and all of them, uh, if they have Eclipse websites, have information and resources, we do provide as many links as we can on our website and are constantly adding more data, resources, documents, handouts. We've got a multi-page uh, document that just is a glossary of solar terms to familiarize with, with some that uh, you may not be uh, too aware of. And then, of course, the American Astronomical Society. If you if you remember any <laughs> any organization, uh, the American Astronomical Society has a multitude of resources from videos, um, available photos, how to safety practices, vetted eyeglass vendors, um, and of course, task forces, both for informal and formal education uh, to help prepare folks for the eclipse. So I know it's a it's a great deal of of data. These are upcoming events uh, leading up to to the eclipse including our Lunch and Learns 
and uh, and our and our quarterly roundtable meetings. So uh, I'll try to make sure to get as much information over to Tricia to get this all out to you, uh, so you can have access to it and get as engaged and involved as you want to, um, and provide that information to you know the the students in your life, the young girls that are you know interested in eclipses. You know this is a prime opportunity to really push STEM and push the importance of this work. Uh, you know, eclipses, there's some science that we can't actually even conduct except for during an eclipse because we can't create eclipses artificially in, in a laboratory. So, you know, this is a prime time to really capture that, that interest and that passion in somebody, uh, you know, young and old. Um, but, you know, I expect to see a lot of enthusiasts in our schools, in our scout groups, you know, coming from this, you know, I expect you know, in years to come when folks recount how they got into heliophysics or how, you know, the, the first female that lands on the moon, you know, one of, one of her first, you know, uh, drives to, to become interested in astronomy, you know, might've been her first experience with the total solar eclipse of, of 2024. So this is a really inspiring and exciting and great time to be alive and getting an opportunity to, to see one of these phenomena. So thank you. Wow, are y'all excited or what? <laughs> I think you just knocked it out of the eclipse park, Don. Um, I, oh, I, know, <laughs> I know I'm super excited. We probably have time for a question or two if anyone has them. Um, please throw uh, throw your question in the chat if you have a question. Again, we'll share out all of these resources afterwards. But I I also had the experience of experiencing totality in 2017. And it's unlike anything you've ever experienced. So figure out a way to get to that path of totality during. Oh, absolutely. It is, it is worth it. It is worth it. And if you're in Texas, find a friend and go hang out. Get my contact information from Trisha. If you don't know where to be, if you don't know where to go, I, I will help you out. I mean, I, one of the, the great terms, I think, that came out of uh, one of the early American Astronomical Society meetings was, uh, you know, specifically focusing on kids was no child left inside. Um, and I think that goes for everyone. You know, it, you, you don't need to be on the path of totality to experience the eclipse. It's great if you can, but just just get outside and see it because it is, I, I, I can't even put it into words. You know, it's and I think what Don said about that whole community feel, that experience, if, if you experienced the one that was in October, everyone's experiencing maybe not exactly the same view, but that same experience. And so there's there's really something quite um, fascinating about that. I ended up in Johnson, uh, we went down to Kerrville for the one in October, and we ended up just watching the whole eclipse and the ring of fire from the little grassy area adjacent to the parking lot of the Hampton Inn that we were staying in with people from LA and Georgia and Austin and Chicago and all over the, the United States that had come in. And we just hung out in the parking lot and all experienced it together and had an amazing time. So it's a great community event. Please don't miss out. And again, I will share these uh, all of this information out because and tell people you know, even if you think they they already know, because there were still people that were caught off guard in October that were like, "Hey, did you did you know there was an eclipse yesterday?" It's like, yes. So and tell get those glasses. Anyway. <laughs> don't wait to the last minute for those glasses. Get those glasses now. Buy a bunch for your neighbors and your friends, and just I put them on my patio, and I just told people while I was in Kerrville. Hey, neighbors, if it's last minute and you don't have any, I left 50 on my patio. Come get them. I think they're still outside. Uh, so I love that. And connect with yeah. us afterwards because we're going to be collecting glasses from all over the hill country and getting those in the hands of Astronomers Without Borders. And they take those glasses and then move them along to the next communities all over the world so that other people, other students, other young folks can experience it without being restricted. That's amazing. So. Okay, we'll we'll do that too. That's awesome. So. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dawn. Um, 